All right. Welcome to the show. JP Danell joins me today. He's a former U.S. Navy SEAL and is now a leadership instructor, speaker, and strategic advisor with Echelon Front. He's a pro team athlete for Origin Maine and Jocko Fuel, and he's a lot more than that, and we can get it firsthand from him on the show. JP, welcome. I'm glad we could get our uh, schedules to line up for this one. <laughs> I appreciate it. You have been more than accommodating and flexible to work with my hectic schedule lately. So I, I apologize, but I'm glad that we're doing this, brother. It's good to see you again. No worries, man. You're all over the place. You're traveling the country. You're, you're pouring into people. Yeah. You're uh, providing right. some perspectives around leadership. Let's, let's uh, just anchor in real quick on, on kind of the nature of, of what you do with an Echelon Front. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So I'm, I started at Echelon Front a little over five years ago. Jocko and Lake brought me on board as their first leadership instructor. Uh, you know, obviously the two of them started the company. Uh, then they brought on a lady by the name of Jamie Cochran, just part-time, just kind of help booking travel. And then as the company grew, she really took ownership of that opportunity to work with Jocko and Leif and, you know, then became, you know, director of operations. Uh, when I came on board and then Dave Burke came on board and we started kind of growing the company. Uh, and then now she's our chief operations officer, which is pretty legit. Right. Oh, yeah. And we all kind of started just trying to figure out what we were going to do to help Jocko and Leif. And they gave me the opportunity to come on board as an instructor. I was very honored for that opportunity, a little intimidated by it at the beginning. And when I say a little, I mean a lot, there's a, a lot of intimidation to be an instructor for what Jocko and Leif had created with extreme ownership and then the economy of leadership came out soon there afterwards. And so at the beginning, I was just giving keynotes and then doing half day, full day workshops with clients and Jocko and Leif had this vision of like, Hey, we really want to grow and expand the company. We want to do more than just coming in and talking to a client or, you know, just doing a one-off thing. And one of the things that I ran in the SEAL teams for training was, um, all of our close quarters combat training and urban warfare training, but we also started some like leadership development for the guys going through training. And we'd run these FTXs, these final training exercises uh, for the guys to, to go through during their workup to be qualified before they deploy. And so Leif and Jock were like, hey, we want to do something similar to that, but for leadership. And so they gave that to me as my department because that's what I used to do at Trade at working for Jocko. And then they knew that they, we really wanted to kind of be more into the consulting, not just, hey, we're going to come in and give a keynote and be gone, which those are great for events, but it was hard for us to measure the impact. And we really wanted to measure the impact and have a, actually, to be honest, a, a longer lasting impact than just going and giving a keynote at some, you know, seminar that the company's having and everyone's all fired up. And then a week later, they go back to doing the same yeah, thing. Again. It's that, it's that uh, so what, now what kind of thing, right? You know, you yeah. get fired up, you fill out your form or two, you get some perspective that's shifted or changing. And then you hit that first roadblock or that first like point of friction and you don't know where to go next and you don't have somewhere to ask questions. Like, it tends to erode, right? Yep, absolutely. And so Dave Burke created our leadership development alignment program called the LDAP, right? And that's where we'll come in and we'll partner with a client. We'll come in and give an initial extreme ownership brief. We'll do assessments of the leadership of the team. Uh, and then we figure out, okay, what type of relationship partnership do we need? What, what are you guys wanting out of this? And then uh, we put together a package and we submit it to them. And it's, it's been awesome. Uh, all the field training exercises that I've been running have been extremely impactful. I mean, our clients come back and a year later and they're like, hey, we're still using those principles that you guys taught us. And we're like, okay, that's, that's a good measure of impact. When a client is still using things a year after we worked with them, it's changing the culture. So for me, it's extremely fulfilling to be able to see that happening. And we had these FTXs set up just for corporate, uh, I'm sorry, just for the corporate side. And as we were growing the FTX program, the field training exercise program, uh, we saw that there was a, a desire and a demand from individuals and in smaller companies that couldn't afford to bring us in for their company, or they just didn't, obviously, they didn't have the the number of employees needed to run the training. 
And so what we did is we created an individual FTX program to where it's similar to the muster. Like you can sign up and come to muster by yourself, or you can send your team or you can send your whole company. That's what Jocko and Leif created the first muster, which is a two-day leadership event that we run at Echelon Front so that people could see the material, they could get value from the material, whether they wanted to bring us to work with them or not. And a lot of companies will come and test it out, right? They're like, hey, we want to bring Echelon Front out, but we're not sure. Let's go to their event and see what they're about. Then they come to the event and they're like, all right, let's, let's book out an engagement. Or let's say it's you and you just have a, 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 you're just a solo entrepreneur. Well, you're not going to have, be able to afford to bring Echelon Front to come sit and just talk with you, come to the muster. And so we did the same thing for the FTXs. It's two full days of all of our hands-on scenario-based leadership training. Uh, and we have it available for individuals. We have it available for corporations. Uh, all of our individual ones have sold out so far. We've done three of them. Our fourth one is already sold out. Our fifth one has, I think, four seats left for it. And we keep it small. It's a small group of about 30 to 35 people. And it's two full days with Jocko Leif, myself, and another Echelon Front instructor going through scenario-based leadership training. And the, and the scenarios that we're running are similar to what we did in the SEAL team. You're going to go conduct a capture-kill mission against my role players, right? And my role players are former and current SEALs, uh, MARSOC guys, Green Berets, Rangers, SWAT guys. Like these are the guys that you're going up against. But what's cool is it's all scenario based. So my role players are sticking to their scripts and their scenarios so that we drive the leadership principles home real time. And then we come back from that mission and we debrief the mission. Okay, hey, what did you learn from that mission? What was your biggest takeaway in regards to these laws of combat, these mindsets of victory? And what applies to you in your business or your home life. And we do that after every single mission. And then we rotate through the different leadership positions. So like, let's say, you know, you're the officer in charge of, of run one. You might be a fire team leader run two, or you might just be a shooter run two, right? So now you have no responsibilities. You're just a shooter. You're listening to your fire team leader, your squad leaders, your officer in charge, your AOIC. So it's really cool to rotate everyone through all the different positions and we, uh, we invested into these high-speed laser tag systems that um, allow us to control the scenarios real time. Also, it eliminates all the safety risk. So you're not being shot by paintballs or airsoft. And there's no risk for projectiles, right? Now, a lot of people initially are like, oh, man, that'd be cool. I want that. Well, we're not teaching tactics, yeah. So we're not, we're not worried about the tactical side of like, Hey, you're out in the open, you're getting shot, find cover. That's not the purpose of our training. There's a lot of really good companies that teach that training. Go get that training from them. We're, we're worried about the leadership training of like, Hey, your plan was so complicated that when you guys went out there into the village to do a tribal en engagement meeting, you know, with the elder, nobody knew what to do. And everybody because they didn't know what to do, they either froze and did not move or they decided to start doing their own thing because they had no parameters to operate in. They had no overall guidance and they, it all went to hell and you got half of your team killed. And so it's really fun to see those light bulb, boom, real time yeah. click. Like you'll be out in the middle of mission and I've literally had guys go, all right, I just, we got to stop it. I'm like, what? I was like, are you okay? Like, I thought he was injured. He's like, we have to just, can we stop this? And I'm like, why? He's like, I don't know what to do. I'm too overwhelmed right now. And I'm like, cool. Wow. I was like, hey, let's take it. And this is laser tag, bro. Yeah. Like, and this guy was in charge of the run, but everything was so chaotic. I'm like, hey, let's take a breath. Let's think about it. I'm like, where are you at right now? Um, what village are we in? Okay, cool. Where are you supposed to be meeting your source on the north side? All right. Hey, that's that, that direction is north. Okay, yeah, we have some enemy fighters that are moving around the area. Were you on time? He goes, no, we were late. I'm like, okay, well, if we would have been on time, they wouldn't have been here. I'm like, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to push through and flank these enemy fighters and get to your source to get the intel? Or do you want to fall back? Or do you want to split forces, which is never recommended? He goes, I, I think we should maybe flank the fighters and then push onto the source to see if he's still there. I'm like, 
cool. Make the call. And he's like, he looks to his squad leaders and he tells them what to do. And then they went off and did it. And he goes, oh. like it was yeah. awesome. Oh, but literally the guy went from, I thought he was going to fall out from like whatever was going on to, okay, I can do this. And when we, you know, we finished the mission, we came back to the tactical operation command center and we, and we did a real time debrief and he went last because he was officer in charge. And so I had the fire team leaders, squad leaders talk. And uh, I was like, Hey man, what'd you take away from that? <laughs> and he goes, my plans were way too complicated and I need to learn to detach. And I said, I just asked him, I said, does this reflect who you are at work? He goes, Oh yeah. <laughs> and some of his coworkers were in there like, yes, absolutely. And I'm like, well, what part of it? He goes, I, he goes, I just complicate things. He's like, I just try to make things way too complicated. And I have a really hard time just detaching from my emotions. I said, so is this something that we can work on? He goes, yep, absolutely. I'm like, all right, cool. So, you know, they filling out in his little, well, we have these little workbooks that we create for everybody. So after each mission, you come back, you talk about the debrief, you fill it out and go back and so it was it's been really fulfilling seeing that mm -hmm. program develop and we've worked with thousands of individuals now over the last couple of years putting them through these whether it's a com it's a combination of corporate and individual uh and so that's that's what i do at echelon front man which is cool because <clears throat> i tell people i'm like hey the the best job i've ever had in my life was in the seal teams uh, this is the absolute second best. There's nothing that comes close to it. I love being able to speak with people. Um, I don't like speaking in front of groups, but I like being able to speak to people and relay the, uh, the lessons that we learned in combat and in training, what we've been developing and learning at Echelon Front. Uh, so it's, it's been really cool to see how the journey at Echelon Front has evolved. And yeah. it's really cool to see how it's just evolved with our clients as well. You know, there's, that's awesome. And the, uh, I guess the thing that I'm, I'm picking up in this is like through the training that you were just describing, like you are making the table stakes, you know, it's laser tag, but you're making the table stakes a lot higher oh, so yeah. that, so that those character flaws or those personality traits can get expressed through this kind of like oh, new we venue, can... like so we control everything. So therefore we control the amount of stress that gets put into it. Yeah. And the That's more stress we add, the more, um, more of who you really are comes out. You can hide in a, in a controlled environment, but when stress hits, hits you, who you are is what comes out. That's beautifully said. I, um, uh... I'm a big fan of the book, Extreme Ownership. That's how I got into this whole, this whole world, right? Of, of just kind yeah. of like knowing who you were, knowing who Jocko is, like following Jocko's podcast and, and just like really looking toward folks that I admire as leaders to obtain their perspective and then try to apply it into my own personal life. And I was actually, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about how I came across Extreme Ownership. Um, I, had a, I had a guy uh, that I was, he was my boss's boss. And, uh, I, man, I like him as a human being. Um, but as a leader, I really didn't care for him. I, I definitely didn't respect him, at least at the time. Um, don't know how I would be today reporting to him, but I was a different person at that time. He is a different person at that time. We yeah. just didn't jive, uh, overly yeah. well, but, but you know, much love and, and respect to him, but he knew that I was working on my self and leadership and those types of things. And he actually gave me the book extreme ownership and he wrote a nice card in it and he was like hey you know i think this book is right up your alley i highlighted some passages for you and those types of things um that i want you to think on and because i didn't really respect him as a leader i kind of felt like that was like a slight toward me it's like oh, okay. you know and then like as i'm reading the book i'm like that's all you and that's all you and that's all you and so like i missed the point for like the first like the first pass that I was reading through the book. I'm just like, that's your fault. And, that's your... and then as I was reading, these are I'm the like, things that you should have been doing. <laughs> right. But then as I'm leading, I, you know, I, so I give the book another chance. I was flying somewhere. Um, and then I, I just started reading it. And then I was like, oh no, this is not about him. This is like, this is about me. 
And this is about how I show up. And this is about what I take responsibility for. And this is about how consistent I am. And this is about how I show up for teams um, and the way that I communicate. Um, and so it was a book that just like, it definitely shifted my perspective and opened up this world of, I was probably doing things the wrong way, which is why I probably had a fundamental tension with this individual, you know, regardless of what his shortcomings were, I was responsible for <laughs> what I needed to, to uh, own up to and, and uh, get after. Um, you were serving in the teams under Jocko yes. uh, and, and group as, and you know, this book wasn't created back then. This was evolved through lessons learned yep. uh, and the missions that you served in as well. Like as you reflect on the impacts that extreme ownership has on folks like me, uh, but then also knowing kind of the origins of, you know, many of the concepts and tools and how it was created, yeah. like, how do you connect that, those two? And like, how do you, how do you look at that today? It's, it's really cool to actually be able to do that and look back. Um, and I will say five years ago when I first was coming on the team and I was, you know, I had the brief that Jock and Leif were giving and I was creating and making it kind of my own brief, um, it really sparked like a lot of stories and a lot of memories of, oh, yeah, Jocko didn't call it extreme ownership back then, but he told us to take ownership and take responsibility. And he didn't allow us to blame other units or other departments while we were going through our workup. And you saw that being reflected in Leif and Seth as well. And they both really, uh, respected and admired Jocko for the leader that he was, the reputation that he had. And so when your boss has this high level of respect for his boss, that naturally kind of fed into us. Like, we're like, okay, cool. Like, I love Seth. I respect Seth. And if this is what Seth thinks of this guy, Jocko, well, guess what I think? The same thing. Mm -hmm. and And so that was... I remember now at that time, I didn't go, oh, Seth's attitude is contagious to me. But now I look back and I'm like, oh, Seth's attitude was contagious to me because the way that Seth acted towards Jocko, we all acted the same way. The way that Leif acted towards Jocko, his platoon acted all the same way. And so that actually helped us as a group establish some you know unity and an even stronger bond i mean we're a good group but there's always this natural like um conflict and 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 silos between the two platoons and a task unit because i mean yes you're a task unit so you're one team but there's two platoons in a task unit so there's a that natural competition but jocko did a really good job of helping us understand like hey we are tasking a bruiser that's who we are. And so a lot of those silos were, were broken down, which I hadn't seen before. Um, and I didn't see a lot of, in a lot of other task units. And so that was one of them that I, I look back and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, hey, we all kind of thought the same way because of, of our leadership. Well, we didn't really blame a lot of people because Jocko told us to take responsibility. And, you know, the, the natural thing in the military is like, if you're trying to get some gear from supply, well, what, what do most people do? They wait until the very last minute, the trips next week, they're like, Hey, we need this gear and supplies. Like we don't have this gear. And you're like, well, screw supply, blah, blah, blah. You start bad mouth and supply. And well, in reality, like you waited until the last minute, like one, you don't have a good relationship with supply Two, You didn't plan ahead of time. You didn't do what you were supposed to do if you would have had a good relationship, if you would have planned ahead, if you would have done what you're supposed to do, then you would have gotten the gear that you needed in time. And, and so when, when Jocko, Leif and Seth kind of took that away from us of us not being able to blame anybody else, it started to improve the relationships that we had with all these other departments. And we recognize, Oh, if I have a really good department, if I have a really good relationship with X, Y, Z department, I tend to get what I need. I get it ahead of time. And then those guys end up being proactive and saying, hey, I see these trips coming up. What do you guys need help with? And it was crazy. It was just a complete game changer. And so when we went through our workup, we 
crushed it. Like every block of training we went through, the instructors were like, this is the best group that we've ever seen ever. And Jocko was like, Hey, don't ever fucking tell my guys that again, ever. Don't tell them that they're the best. I don't want that complacency to creep in, which I thought was really cool because again, Jocko from the leadership standpoint is I understand. Yes, we are the best. We were crushing everybody. Nobody came close to us, but don't tell my guys that because I want them to stay hungry. And that was my first little realization of, Oh, my leadership was helping us fight complacency because when complacency creeps in, things fall apart. Absolutely. When you're misaligned, things fall apart. When you don't communicate, things fall apart. When you don't have a good relationship, things fall apart. So Jocko yeah. saw all these things and you know, just he didn't, and he was so indirect about all of it. None of it was a direct like order. It was suggestions or Hey, what do you think about this? And he'd ask you a question and then your answer would show you what was going on. And you're like, all right, I see what's happening here. <laughs> roger that. <laughs> yeah, roger that, sir. I'm an idiot again. <laughs> oh, man. So, dude, it's I'm so fired up just listening to you talk about all this, right? Um, from the standpoint of you get to go out and deliver this training, deliver it through your lens and your perspective uh, of, you know, kind of its origins or at least, you know, the, the fundamental prin principles that fed yeah. into this framework. Um, and, and we changed a lot of training also when we came back from Ramadi and I, I don't know if I cut you off, you're about to go there, but this thought just came to my mind. I don't, I've never shared this on a podcast because I had just forgotten about it. And I was talking to one of my guys two weeks ago from Delta platoon. And he, he was telling me this, we were, he was talking and we started like reliving this story together. And I'm in tears laughing. Like I'm in tears laughing, but when I tell you the story, you're going to be like, what's wrong with you guys? Why would you guys be laughing about this? So we're doing a sniper overwatch. And so the reason why I want to share the story is because, because this happened to us, we pushed this feedback back and it started, guys started changing the way we were doing training to prepare, to prepare for combat. And Jocko was doing this constantly. So we're doing the sniper overwatch and we're in this building. I'm giving you the cliff notes version because it would take a while to like tell the whole story. Yeah. But there's more to this one. I mean, this whole thing was a crazy, like this, I got left behind on this mission, bro. Okay. Like, that's how crazy this got. Like, Literally, guys were running out of ammo. We had enemy fighters coming in on our position. We couldn't get tank support. We had to fall back to the closest combat outpost. We screwed up the head count, and I got left behind on target by myself, bro. It was a crazy thing. But before we got to that point, what happened is we were scanning this area, and uh, one of our snipers was getting ready to take a shot, and Seth was like, nope, hold off. Let's let the situation develop. Now, it was within the rules of engagement. This guy could have taken the shot, but Seth wanted things to develop a little bit more. It wasn't like, hey, we really have to take this shot right now. And so also now we then we hear like a shot go out. Well, from our, in an urban environment, it's really hard to figure out where that shot came from, where it's going, unless it's like coming right at you, like then it cracks right past your head. Like in an urban environment, you're like, is it because the okay, sound like, bounces off all the walls and stuff? Oh, it's all over the place, right? And if I'm inside of a building shooting two rooms deep, where do you, like, you ain't going to find that. You know what I mean? Like in the movies, they're like, oh, it came from there. You're full of shit. No, it didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, unless the guy's waving out the window and then shooting his gun and you see the silhouette, it's very, very difficult. Very difficult, Okay. Because then also you can't see everything. And I, I, when I say an urban environment, I'm not talking about these rural neighborhoods that people think about. I'm talking, you go to a downtown city and I want you to go to a parking garage that overlooks a park and buildings and retail areas and all those doors and windows and alleyways and tell me that you're going to be able to be scanning 100% of that and see where a shot comes from. No. Yeah. It ain't going to happen, right? And so anyways, shot goes off. So this guy comes over here to my room where I'm sitting right here. And uh, Seth is sitting right to my right. 
and he comes and stands right behind me and I'm on my gun, I'm scanning. And he comes in here, he goes, did you guys just shoot? And we're like, no, because he thought he got pissed because Seth had told him not to take the shot and he thought we took the shot, right? And we're like, no. So he stands right behind me and I go like this because as I'm sitting there, I go like this to turn to look at him. And as I move right where my head was in his body armor, he gets shot. Like right there. And the round, and he had his magazine and he was smoking. He was like, he was like trying to get his body armor off. And like, so obviously that happens. He falls back. Seth goes to the ground. I go to the ground. Some shots came into the room right after that happened. And the round went through his SR 25 magazines that he had on his plate carrier and then into the body armor and stopped. And that's right where my head was. It was an enemy sniper. Wow. Yeah. And it was crazy. And we're sitting there. Well, the funny thing is like Seth and I, we can't stop laughing because he's laying there and his, the, the rounds in his magazine caught on fire from the round going through and he's all smoking and everything. He's like trying to get the magazine out of the plate. Dude, it was hilarious. You guys are laughing about it as it's happening. Oh yeah. Real time. We're like, (laughs) we're laughing at them. (laughs) Well, we knew he was okay. Like once we recognized that he wasn't like dead or severely wounded. Yeah. We're laughing about it because we're also like laying down, being pinned down in there. And there's like rounds coming into the room now because, you know, obviously they saw us. And, um, but anyway, where do you have to be? Like, is that just a natural byproduct of being in a high stress environment is like finding the funny too, and finding the levity, or is it like, is that something that's like developed over time? It's just, it is what it is. And you, you know, that, you're in well, a high stakes environment. I think it's a, it's a combo of what you just asked because the training we would go through was always so stress induced to help guys work through those stressful situations, be able to do decision-making real time in a stressful situation that when you do that enough, it becomes natural and your, your brain can rewire how it does stuff. It really can. And so the more times you put yourself in a stressful environment, the easier it becomes to detach, recognize that you're in a stressful environment. Your body is like, oh, cool. Initially, I thought this was stressful. It's not. Let's lower all the stuff that's going on. We're not in a fight or flight mode right now, right? I'm not in survival mode. I can relax. And then you can actually laugh about it. And so that's where we are. I have a video of me on a rooftop and we were getting just crazy, crazy attack from these enemy fighters i mean we're sitting on the rooftop like with the big thick walls all the way around my buddy's sitting across from me and we're i'm videoing it i'm just like you know the old school selfie mode with the cameras where you press play and then you turn it around and you hope that you're in that right yeah doing that um and we're just laughing and dude the the wall like there's like fragments of the wall being like shot up over us because that's how much we're being shot at they shot they shot rockets at the building rockets are going over and my buddy's just like pulls out a can of dip and he's like like packing a dip and he's like putting a big old lipper in and he's laughing mikey's laughing seth is laughing i'm like this is awesome right because it was just part of that was like every day and you i guess if we're looking for a takeaway from that, yeah, it would be what's one thing you can always control attitude. your attitude, right? I can't control the environment that I'm in. I can't, I can control my attitude. I can control how I react to it, but I can't control the fact that we're surrounded by enemy fighters. I can't, I can't control any of that. I can't control the fact that I can't put my head up because if I do put my head up, I'm going to get shot. And, you know, guys are looking over the wall with little periscopes. And they're like, damn, dude, this ain't going to end. Any-. You know, like calling in for tank support. Cool. You know what? We have assets. Like, you know what? Our tanks, yeah, they'll handle that, right? Those brave soldiers and Marines that we worked for, and I say for because it was their battlefield and we were there to support them. When we would call in for tank support, those guys would say, Roger that, we're on our way. And those are some of the bravest humans I've ever worked alongside. 
those soldiers and those Marines were absolutely incredible. And guess what? They would show up and they would disseminate those enemy fighters because they had tanks and tanks are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah right? helpful, helpful piece of machinery, I think a tank is, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I believe it's one of the best inventions that is known to mankind. Um, but yeah, I, it was just one of those things where that was part of our, it was part of the life, man, that we lived. And you just, you have to adapt to it. You have to make it fun. You have to make it enjoyable. And you have to understand that it's the environment that you're in. Yeah. So you have to choose the attitude that you're going to have. You know, you were talking about being in a sniper uh, overwatch. Obviously um, that was some of your, that was your role, right? Yeah. On the, on, on the team. Lead sniper, yeah. Yeah. Lead sniper. So like one, it's such a, like in, in movies and things like that, it's such a glamorized like role, right? The sniper, the quiet yeah. observer, yeah. the person who's watching, the, the one yeah. who t- takes the shot. Um, did you always want to do that as a role inside either in the military or did you find it? Like, how did you, were you just a really good shot out on the range? And they're like, that's a sniper. Like, <laughs> how does that yeah. work? So I never touched a gun until I was in boot camp. Say what again? Uh, what? say that again i never shot an actual gun until i was in boot camp except for like a a pellet gun okay like i had bb guns and pellet guns growing up because i used to play navy seals and i used to play army rangers i used to play marine you know i used to i used to play uh pararescue because my uncle was a pararescue in the air force so i used to play all those things um and i knew what a sniper was because i watched that old school sniper movie back in the day yeah and um which i think i think it was just called sniper right and yeah uh, yeah yeah. and but then i got into the military and um i you know was pretty bad at pistol uh shooting at the time well you guys so when i was going through training you know, our instructors and buds, like they're trying to teach you to shoot, but they're also trying to put on pressure. And some of my third phase instructors, they were, they were assholes, to be honest, they weren't good instructors, they were just assholes. And some of the older students, they recognize like, like JP's never shot a gun before. And if you're going to be screaming and doing all this stuff in his face, like, yeah, he's not going to shoot well. Right. Like, yeah. you know, and so they were kind of helping out with that. And then actually there were some instructors that were really cool and they're like, all right, here's the fundamentals of shooting. And they'd pull me and a few other guys aside that were really struggling with the pistol part. Cause if you didn't qualify, like you got rolled back. And if you didn't qualify, you were done. Right. And I was just like, okay, I at least have to qualify the bare minimum. And so I was able to do that. And then the more time I put into it, then I, I got really good with pistol, really good with rifle, um, you know, compare, you know, compared for what, what, what we were doing in our community. And um, I just, I was really intrigued by the whole sniper thing. And I remember asking the snipers in my first platoon about it. And I, they knew that I wanted to do it. And there's just one of those things. And I was really good at, navigating land navigation um you know so i was always like our backup point man my first platoon rear security uh i could look at a map and like just look at the train features look around and know exactly where i was at i could get us wherever we needed to go without a compass without a gps if i had a topographical map i can get myself almost anywhere in the world you and i are complete opposites of human beings i can have i can have a map and exact coordinates in a sherpa and get lost 100 percent. i am so i am so terrible like i'll get i'll take a i'll be in my town i live in a town with two stoplights i'll get turned around on like little back roads in the town and be like where am i going and literally boise the mountains are north like yeah. that's that's it like that's, are you that's, related to my wife are you guys like cousins or brothers dude, probably but and my and my wife is she, you know on the asvab she like scored you know highest percentile of that she's like she knows directions she's like she would have been perfect like military because she's like she's dialed in ready to go she just has like really she's calm great context and then there's me i'm like i don't know where we are she's like you're in the driveway <laughs> my, my wife called me one time I will go back to the story, but I have to share this because you said this. And if she listens to this, she's going to kill me, but whatever. She calls me. She's like, hey, something's wrong with your truck. And I'm like, what? What's wrong? 
and I was out of town on a work trip. She's driving my truck. And uh, she was like, I just filled it up and it's, it's empty. Like, I don't know if someone stole the gas or is there something wrong with it? Oh, and no. she's driving and I'm like, what you like, you just filled it up. She goes, yeah, I don't know what's wrong. And I'm like, what road are you driving on? She's like, Goodman. I'm like, what, like, where are you driving from or where are you driving to? Cause I know not to ask her cardinal directions. Right. And she's like, well, I'm headed this way. I'm like, cool. You're driving East. That's the compass saying that you're driving East on the dash. Like, <laughs> okay. I gotta go. I, I love you. And I'm like, the- dude i i'm not gonna say uh that i'm not capable of that like, i'm totally i'm totally capable of doing that so, you know, especially jake 10 years ago jake 10 years ago would have done that with a smile on his face and be like oh i learned something today yeah we're like oh cool yeah but it was funny we always joke about that but um yeah so i was i just had a really good sense of natural and i still do of direction of hey this is where i'm at this is where we're trying to go uh, and so that's a good trait for a sniper, for a point man. And sniper point man's always, you, they always kind of seem to be that same type of personality for some weird reason. It's weird. Yeah. In the teams, we have like different jobs, and it always seems like the same type of personality always kind of gets those roles. Yeah. And um, yeah. And then I came back from my first uh, deployment, and they were talking about, okay, hey, who's going to sniper school? And like I would like before I could raise my hand, like, and they're like, Danelle, you're going. I'm like, yes. And so I got selected to go to sniper school, which I was pretty stoked about. Uh, went through a condensed course and um, it was awesome. But, you know, I've, I've talked to a few other buddies about this and I'm like, man, you know, I, I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. But when I was a kid, man, I used to build urban sniper hides without knowing what I was doing. And then when I was an adult in the SEAL teams, and building urban sniper hides i was like i was doing this when i was a kid without the instruction nobody taught me how to do that i literally did that in my garage um you know our house was off the street like we had the driveways that were at an angle right so the house was kind of sat up off the road on the side of the house we were at and you know a nice front yard big tree this is in northern california you know so we had about a quarter of an acre uh lot that we lived in um, good backyard, good front yard, driveway that went up to the uh, house or walk way up the front porch. Well, I went out to the street. Like I wanted like to build this like, like sniper hide with my pellet gun. And so what I did is I went, I cracked the garage door. I turned off all the lights in the garage. I set up my gun where I could lay behind and I could just like scan as cars. But all I was doing was like uh, practicing, observing people. That's literally what I would do for hours. Just watch people drive and take notes. Why? I have zero clue. I was <laughs> it's like, well, I do know why. God was like, hey, I'm preparing you for yeah. what you're going to do in life. You know, we're going to start uh, on those 10,000 hours pretty early, young man. <laughs> you're gonna yeah, I this. guess so. He's like, hey, man, we're going to get you up to speed before, you know. Yeah. And, but it was crazy. I got all that stuff set up, went into the house, went outside, went out to the street, and was looking from the street view to see if I could see myself set up in there. And mm-hmm. I was like, all right, cool. And then we'd go back up in there. It was wow. crazy. Well, you know, I, I've got to think as you were telling that story, I'm like, what, like what feelings I would have personally, like sitting in a sniper overwatch. And it's like, there's gotta be some kind of like, I don't know. I, I, I get the sing song in my head. It's like, you can't see me. <laughs> you don't oh, know. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, there's been, yeah, there's absolutely amazing when you, uh, you know, there's times in urban environments, obviously, and also rural environments where you're completely vegged up, you're in your ghillie suit, you're blended in the surroundings. And like the distance from me to my wall, which is, I don't know, maybe nine feet, maybe, you know, no, this is, in, I don't know. Anyways, about, you know, let's say anywhere between seven to 10 feet myself and this other guy we had people walking that close to us and had zero clue we were there like zero clue like a dog walking with a dog and the dog knew somebody was around but was confused like i remember that i remember having everything vegged up and my pistol i was laying here with my pistol just in case right because these guys were close to us and we were me and this other guy were both like laying with our pistols ready and we're kind of just sitting there 
And the dog was just like, I know another human's here, but I can't figure out what's going on. And the owner's like uh, trying to pull it, you know, and it was just like, and it was on this shitty piece of rope leash, right? It wasn't a leash. It was a piece of rope that was like tied around the neck of the dog. And it was just like, man, I don't want to get bit by some savage dog over here, man. Oh, damn, man. But, but that's, yeah, it's crazy. It's a crazy feeling, man. But it goes back to training preparations and patience, man. Like to be in that environment, you have to be really patient. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That's a, like my, my hands like sweat a little bit, just even like talking about the fact that you're, you know, I've gotten like zero training. Right. So it's like, but even just kind of like talking through that process of like, someone doesn't know you're there and you're right next to them. And like, man, my, I, I get kind of like, I get nervous just even thinking about it, thinking about being in that position or thinking about, um, and then also like you're, you've got such an important role for being the eyes for people. Yeah. And so like having to stay, like pay attention all day and like understand what's, you're just like glassing, like you're hunting all day. Like it's. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, bro, that stuff, that is exhausting. You know, people don't understand like how actual like tiresome being on glass, scanning, uh, tracking data is, you know, cause then you're taking notes, you're relaying it to, the you know i would be relaying what i'm seeing to mikey mikey's relaying it over the radio yeah. it was like non-stop you know and we're sitting up on rooftops where it's a 120 130 plus degrees you're in your full body armor kit all your stuff because you know guys were kind of at times like all right i'm gonna take off my body armor, i'm gonna take off this you know if you're hot but then there's times where like the buildings that we were in would be mortared right or we'd be attacked by enemy fighters and it's like all right get your gear back on it's like and finally, South is like, hey, guys, like, we're not taking our gear off. I know it sucks, but we're not taking it off during some of these times. And so now you're on a rooftop with all your gear on laying there and you just have to stay dialed in. And so what I would do is I would, you know, whatever I'm seeing, I would just repeat it back to me. Like I was talking to myself. I would talk to myself about what I was seeing. If I had to take some notes, I'd take some notes and then I would relay it to Mikey. So by that time, I had seen it, said it, and heard it three different times. Mm -hmm. So I would say it to myself, and then I'd hear myself saying it. I would write it down, and I would read what I was writing down. So then now I'm saying it again, I'm hearing it again, and I would say it to Mikey, and Mikey would repeat it back to me, or I'd say it to the other sniper. So that was one of the ways that would help kind of keep myself engaged and also help kind of retain those, those key pieces of information. Yeah. So you, I mean, now, obviously you're not in the, uh, doing the, the SEAL team stuff anymore. Like how often do you shoot? Not enough, man. Not, like, enough. not, not often. I, I need to get back <clears throat> into shooting more. I want to get consistent again with it. Uh, we have played with the idea of adding that as a service at Echelon Front, where it's more of like a, an experience where, uh, it's tied, you know, obviously at Echelon Front, our primary focus is leadership and we're never going to get away from that. But we also do know that like, hey, people want to go shooting and if, you know, we can kill two birds with one stone. So that's something we might play with. Um, I'm thinking about doing a promotion with Jocko Fuel and uh, to promote Sour Apple Sniper. Yeah, I want to um, talk about that too. Um, yeah, yeah, we can talk about that for sure. And um, where... I don't know. It's going to be something where we track like the, the sales that people have of the energy drinks. And then I think we're going to pick one or two people where they're going to come out to Texas and spend two days with me shooting. We're going to do some long range shooting, some pistol shooting, some rifle shooting. We're going to do some jujitsu and then we're going to oh, do yeah. some barbecue. So. Well, hell yeah. Well, actually let's go to that sour apple sniper. Now, by the way, <laughs> I got to say, I got to say my, it's my second favorite flavor. Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a may I'm a mango mayhem guy. Like oh, I just, yeah, I like yeah. the mango. I'm always going to mango wins for me. As far as fruit goes, yeah. I tend to pick mango first, but that sour apple sniper is good. I rank it above watermelon. It is good. So you know, I like, I mean, obviously I like the sour apple sniper yeah. for me. I mean, it's my signature flavor, but I also really like the flavor. Yeah. Uh, the afterburner orange, man, it, for me, I'm an orange flavored guy. Good. Like I love that, but Here's the deal. All the flavors so are good. so good. It's <laughs> so really, good. it's really like the new Citrus Psycho. 
Yeah. Lace flavor, Haterade, is crazy good. Haterade? Yeah, it's called <laughs> Haterade. <laughs> That's so awesome. So the actual name on it, it doesn't say Haterade. It says on a signature because I think when Jocko started talking about it with Lace, another company that rhymes with Haterade copyrighted that. Hmm. Which we're like, oh, cool. You guys are watching. Good to know. Yeah. But uh, anyways. That's uh, a, you know, it's like funny. It's funny. Jack I, Savage is good. My boy, Dakota Meyer. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Jack Savage is good. It's a camel can, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So tastes, good. Tastes similar to Dr. Pepper. It's like a cherry vanilla flavor. Yeah. Um, Dakota Meyer. I mean, he's legitimately one of my heroes. And I get to call him a friend, friend now as well, which is really cool. He's a living metal of honor recipient, which is insane Insane. he was the first i don't know if you knew this he was the first living medal of honor recipient in the marine corps since vietnam i did not know that crazy yeah his story on jocko's podcast is absolutely insane and then um he's got a really good book as well well i caught him i caught him on uh rogan's podcast and i didn't listen to the episode jocko i gotta go back and do that uh yeah stand by it's intense his book is called uh into the fire okay and but his episode with jocko is it's emotional man like you're like i'm just that's why i say stand by like either be on like a long drive to where you can start and finish it all at once or uh be in an environment where you can listen to it process it and you don't you know i don't know that's at least how i am because i get emotionally involved into things yeah and I was listening to his pod. I listened to the podcast the first time and I was like, oh my gosh. And then I got to know Dakota and then we became friends. And then I listened to it again and man, it messed me up. Like, cause now I'm like, oh, that's my, bu-. like, those are all the things that my buddy went through. So it's a really good episode, man. All right. I'm getting on that for sure. I got, you know, I got spoiled uh, at that origin camp uh, last year because the Jocko fuel is just available. And I think my DNA is <laughs> turned into like one to 3% Jocko fuel by the time, by the time I left, man, I was, uh, yeah. I, I was two or three a day, but I was like, you know, you don't, it's good. The caffeine content's relatively low it's in the world low. of energy drinks. It's not like overstimulating. You don't get that. Like, I don't know if you've, when you've trained jujitsu, if you've had like an energy drink, that's like actually has a bunch of shit in it before you go. And then all of a sudden you're just like jittery and like tense muscles. Yeah. I, I, it was how, awesome, man. How old are you? I'm 35. Okay, I'm 38. I'll be 39 next month in March. St. Patrick's Day is my birthday. So oh, there you go. It's always a good birthday for an Irish kid, right? Oh, <laughs> so, 100%. Uh, part Irish, part Scottish. But um, I, uh, yo, I, as I've gotten older, I've recognized, and I was not kind to my body when I was in the SEAL teams and, you know, younger. But I recognize, like, I there's some energy drinks, like, I don't drink any of them anymore for the most part because of the discipline goes right. Yeah. Um, like if I'm on the road and we can't find anything, I'm like, oh, okay, which is the best option of these. <laughs> yeah. And I still try not to do that, but man, there, I think back some of those drinks, man, you drink them before a workout and especially jujitsu. I'm like, I might stroke out. I yeah. literally might have a stroke because of all the shit that was in that drink that I drank. I'm like, why do I do that? I don't know. I don't get that. I can drink two i can drink two disciplines on the way to jujitsu and that's still only 190 milligrams of caffeine total which all is, these other drinks have three 450 milligrams which is crazy oh yeah no, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting for like the, like the camel pack that you can buy of energy drink like this is eventually we're gonna have straws hanging over our shoulders or just a drip just walking around yeah. with it because i well, mean you, it's- you see <laughs> some of the other companies where they have like the big one right yeah. And you're like, Wait, wh- why? Who's drinking that? I used to, which is crazy, man, because uh, my uh, the the pituitary gland in my body is all jacked up from like just head trauma and yeah. uh, TBIs and just, you know, shooting a machine gun, shooting any gun is going to cause like a little minor, you know, things. And so all the times of shooting a large caliber rifle, a machine gun, you know, rifle, pistol, all that stuff for the years, explosions um it it affects your brain pretty bad long term and uh it causes all these little micro tears in your brain which scar up 
Uh, and there's times that I, I'll lose like the words that I'm looking for. And it's like kind of hard. Like sometimes I'll be like, uh, you know, anyways, so that also affected the pituitary gland, which affects your testosterone. Okay. And my body in my late twenties, bro, which is scary late twenties stopped producing testosterone. Um, and I've been on TRT since I was 30, about 30. And I was, uh, but I didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize my testosterone levels were tanked. I didn't realize all these things were going on in my life. And I was drinking minimum five of those big energy drinks a day. Wow. You know, like the Dude. really big ones, like maybe two of those and then some smaller ones throughout the day. Man, it would be six o'clock, seven o'clock, and I'd be driving home from work. I was out of the military. I was doing sales at a financial company at the time. And I would be drinking another energy drink just to make it home so I can be awake for the drive and awake to be around a man and the kids for dinner. And yeah, there's times we'd be sitting down at dinner. I'd crack open an energy drink and she'd be like, are you going to sleep? <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying not to fall asleep right now. And it was, man, it was really bad. My body was tanked. It was so bad. Um, but I'm thankful that, you know, I figured out what I needed for TRT. And that's another thing I try to talk about on podcasts and we kind of shifted this way, yeah. um, is, you know, guys that have been and gals, but mostly guys, cause I'm talking about testosterone levels that have been in stress induced careers or environments, firefighters, police officers, you know, military board of patrol EMS, dispatch, whatever, all that, right? Linemen, all these stressful jobs. You need to get your testosterone checked. And a lot of guys hearing this will be like, I'm good because that's their ego talking. And now I was the same way. I was younger. I was in my late twenties. And uh, this guy I knew was like, Hey man, you need to get your testosterone levels checked. And I'm like, no, nah, bro, I'm good. He goes, all right, well, congrats. Like that's one aspect of it because I thought like, oh, my sex drive is high. My wife and I are having sex every day. Yeah. I don't have an issue with testosterone. You know what I mean? And that's why I was like, hey, congratulations. But by the way, that's just one aspect. Yeah. Well, I didn't know. I didn't realize like all the other stuff in my life was just, was tanking. Um, and also doesn't help, doesn't hurt that my wife's smoking hot and I was, you know, <laughs> very attracted to her and i still am you know that's and, awesome you know so i mean i'm being honest right yeah. you know what i mean like she's way out of my category way out of my class i got one of those too yeah i mean yeah we're good salesmen obviously <laughs> obviously <laughs> way out kicked our, our coverage uh anyways and so i thought that was like what meant your testosterone was good well no it wasn't and so i went and got it tested and so at the time and still at this age I think our, our, our window of testosterone should be, you know, 500 to 800, 900 is good. Like if you can be at the 900 range, Ooh, you're good. 500, you're on the lower range, but you're doable. 300, you need to be on TRT, right? If you're in that three to 400 range, boom, actually insurance is like, we will cover it. If you're that low, we'll cover it. And I was like, all right, cool. So I go get tested, bro. I was 81. Wow. It was bad. It was real bad. And to the point they're like, Hey, you need to come get it tested again. Cause they thought like, and then hey, it was, and, and this time bring your testosterone, right? Like I would, you forgot, yeah. you forgot the thing that you were supposed to get tested. That's yeah. What, God, that, that's and then it was, 81 is low, low. That's dangerously low to like the VA. Cause I went and got it tested at the VA. Um, they were concerned because that's like, oh, your testosterone levels are this out of whack. There's like, there's some legitimate concern for mental instability, suicide, uh, stuff like that. And so I went and got tested again the next day and it was 87. And they're like, okay, this is consistent. This is not good. You need to be on TRT. We need to be doing all this stuff. So I found a clinic. I started on it, got everything kind of dialed in, was doing my blood work. Hey, you're on TRT. Uh, now this isn't, this isn't a blanket statement for everybody, but most people, when you're on TRT, your blood gets thicker, right? So you're at risk for clots, strokes, 
That's why like guys like bodybuilders that have been doing large amounts of steroids for so many years, they have strokes and they die at an early age. Right. So being on TRT, now you're not taking those crazy large amounts, obviously, but you're still taking stuff. So you need to be mindful of that. And so, Hey, you need to be doing your blood tests. You need to be make sure all this stuff regulated. You need to be donating blood every six to eight weeks to thin out your blood so that you're not at risk of clotting and having strokes and all this other stuff. And so it's been a, it's been a journey that I've really had to figure out and dial in over the last couple of years, but I had zero clue, man, zero clue that was going on. But when I got that figured out, it's really helped, you know, and it's still a journey. I mean, there's still times where myself will be out of whack or my body's adapting to the new testosterone that it's taking. And so I'll have to split it up to where instead of one shot a week, it's one shot every five days. And then I'll, then I'll go back to, then I'll go to one shot every, like I'll obviously lower the dose, but it'll be a shot every three days for a couple months. And then I go back to one shot a week, every seven days. And I have to constantly change it up so that my body is just kind of like figuring out what's going on. And, uh, but man, I was in a real bad place when my testosterone, uh, was tanked, man, I, I was in a really bad place. And I think, um, and I say, I think, cause I don't know, but I think that's the issue with a lot of veterans and first responders uh committing suicide is because their testosterone levels are so out of whack that they're they're chemically imbalanced because you legitimately are chemically imbalanced when your testosterone levels are tanked to where now because you're chemically imbalanced you think that killing yourself is an option when you're in your right mind not once is killing yourself ever an option ever yeah ever it's yeah it's not like you're at the grocery store and you're just walking around in your right mind like you're saying i mean you can walk around the grocery store not in your right mind but you're just everything's going good in life all that you're like oh should i get milk or eggs should i kill my like it's just not that's not it's not a thought (laughs) it's not a thought ever anybody it's not a thought until things start kind of going on up here in your brain and so i i've i always try to talk about it because um, man, I've gotten feedback literally from almost every podcast I've done. And I've talked about it where somebody will reach out and they're like, Hey, thanks for sharing your story. I kind of felt the same way. I went and got my levels tested. I was 180. And like another guy was like, Hey, I was in the low three hundreds. I've been on TRT for a month. I feel amazing. My, you know, things are good with my family again, my job. Um, I, I, I just did a call the other week with somebody and uh, this guy was a vet and he was just like, yeah, I had the gun to my head. I was going to kill myself. He goes, and I listened to one of your podcasts and I said, you know what? If he can take ownership of over that, I could do the same thing. He goes, I went and got my levels checked. I was super low. He goes, I got on TRT. He goes, I got into counseling. He goes, I read extreme ownership and I took control of my life and I'm still here for my family. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I was like, hey man, if you ever need to call or talk, like, just let me know. Yeah. And so we were connected through a common friend. And then I just did a a, a Zoom call this week. And a guy was a, a veteran in law enforcement as well. Same thing, same situation. And he was just like, yeah, there's multiple times I was thinking about killing myself. And I replayed your podcast episode with Jocko on episode 246 and how, you know, you were down here, you were able to get yourself out of it. And it's just crazy. Like when you hear those types of like stories and that feedback and it just, it's just sad. Wow. It's sad that people are at that point where they think that that's the only option and it's not it it should it's never an option like we can work through stuff you know well it's it's also it's finding community as well right i mean obviously you have to you have to do kind of that work internally go check your levels kind of understand your current state the environment that you're in the kind of people that you're around of course that needs to be uh somewhat on par but also like i find uh so i've been doing jujitsu for about six years 
Um, man, I've got a, we've got a lot of guys, foreign military, first responders, a lot of guys who are like, you know, I love jujitsu, but I also love this community. I love what That's this the, gives me. Yes. The community is so important. Like if you don't have a community, like you're, man, we're not designed to do that. You know, we're not designed to be solo. Yeah. I mean, that's why God created Adam and Eve so that we could, you know, have that bond. And then from there to build families and build tribes and build communities. Now there are some, there's probably somebody listening goes, man, I don't know. I kind of like being by myself sometimes. We all do. Yeah. Because we overwhelm ourselves with life and we just want that break, but we are designed to be around people. And that's, I would say probably one of the most powerful things of jujitsu yeah. is just the community aspect, that family aspect that, Hey, you know what, uh, you know, it's so cool about immersion camp, origin immersion camp, yeah. which if you're listening, you don't know about it. It's a week long jujitsu camp up in Maine. We're staying in cabins on a lake and you do jujitsu all day. It's, amazing. It's, it's, it's seven of my favorite days I had last year where we're all at origin camp. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It's in, as soon as I knew the potential dates, it was already blocked off of my calendar. I'm yeah, like, I just, nope. I just booked the other day. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm going back. Bang. It's, it's amazing, man. Yep. Yep. I just got booked as well. Um, yeah. I was like, I am not missing out on the opportunity to go to camp again, but, um, it was crazy. Um, is I'm sure you recognize this as well. There was no arguing about politics or beliefs. There's no conversations about, I mean, maybe there's conversations, but nobody was arguing there. Like everybody was there to enjoy life, to do some jujitsu. There's no drama. Like there's never any drama, man. Yeah. And that's, what's nice about jujitsu is because you're putting yourself in a position that you're going to be humbled. And if you're in a situation where you've been humbled, then it keeps you humble, which keeps you from creating conflict. Yeah. Yeah. And you would think like outsider looking in, I don't remember how many people were at the, the camp last year. I know it was, you know, somewhere probably in the 200 type type range. Yeah. Um, it was like everybody that you came across was like really there to like learn and to you know they didn't have egos to your point and you would think like, outsider looking in there's going to be a bunch of people who are wrestling around literally trying to choke each other and tap each other out that don't know each other that come from different geographies and different gyms and different philosophies and everybody just shares information and gets along and drinks jocko fuel and takes naps in the sun like it's a it's a pretty it's amazing it's, it's not bad man no it's pretty awesome it's pretty awesome <laughs> So yeah, I'm looking forward to that this year as well. Like, hey, you're traveling around a bunch. Um, I know your schedule's, uh, you know, pretty pretty well packed. Like, what are you looking forward to this year outside of the Origin Camp? I mean, you're you're traveling, you're doing leadership stuff. What else you got going? Man, I got I, we have a lot going on with Echelon Front. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this. Leif and I were talking the other day. Man, I'm really looking forward to seeing my team grow at Echelon Front and when I say my team grow, like, yeah, we'll probably bring on some more people, but honestly seeing like Cody and Carlos and Danny and Cowie and those guys, like seeing them really take on more and build out their teams and grow and develop different programs. Like I'm really looking forward to that because it's been fun to watch their growth and the progression. I mean, these guys are studs. Um, they, they do everything better than I thought I could have done. So if there's one thing I'm pretty decent at, it's, it's recruiting people that are better and smarter than me to be a oh. part of my team. Right. And so oh, for sure, th these guys are all crushing it. Uh, we're really focused on building out these first responder programs within echelon front so that we can is, give back to first responders more. Um, and is, so is that what I attended in, in Nampa in December similar, when you were speaking? Very similar. So that was kind of a, proof of concept thing like hey this is kind of what we want to be doing uh it's focused for first responders but obviously people outside of that community can join as well because these leadership principles are universal um and so um yeah so i'm looking forward to that um let's see on the personal side i well you know 
well, hopefully, you know, everything goes well. My wife and I buying a house, which will be nice. Um, That's awesome. You know, when we moved out here, we were just renting because we didn't know where exactly where we wanted to be. And with me being busy and gone all the time, it's turned into a four year rent, which has been <laughs> slightly That'll frustrating. happen, man, right? It's, it's oh, a- so fast. But you know, the crazy thing is like, even now we're like, so the first year we're like, oh, I'm really glad we're renting because we thought we wanted to live there. And the second year we're like, oh, I'm glad we're renting because man, if we would have moved there, we, boom. And then even now we're like, man, I'm really glad. <laughs> like, cause yeah. this is where we want to be, how we bought last year, boom. So looking forward to buying uh, a house. And um, honestly, I, I don't know if I'd say I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to the challenge aspect of it, but I like to do some jujitsu competitions. There we go. And uh, the reason why I say I'm not looking forward to it is I overthink that type of stuff. And in my mind, if I'm going to sign up for competition to represent my gym, I need to be training five days a week. You know what I mean? And I just need to be doing all this stuff. Well, you know, my schedule, that's never going to happen ever. Like it's happened these last couple of weeks because I've been home and I still haven't even been able to go five days a week because all the virtual stuff I have and all the other commitments. So I think what I need to do is sign up for one, just commit to it. And just show up and it is what it is, right? It just, hey, when I go, I know, here's one thing I do know is once I commit to it and once I actually go out on the mats, like whoever's across me is going to get every single last ounce of energy from me. I'm not going to go out there because I know some guys compete and they're just kind of like, ah, you know, whatever. Hey, I don't care. No, I care. Like you and I on the mat, we slap hands, we bump, like it's. Hey, I've been um, on the other side of that, man. You know, and we were just being playful, but you're hard, oh, to, get yeah, your, yeah. You're hard yeah. to get my arms around, brother. Like I, <laughs> I'm, your upper body, I'm like, I'm like reaching around. I'm like, uh oh, I'm kind of in it now. I don't, <laughs> it was, it was a great role though, man. I, I oh, bro, it. that was, dude, we had an awesome role. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I think I, I just, I need to do that. I want to do that. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Um, and then, you know, just, dude, our son's turning 16. So uh, in next month, in a couple of weeks. So just watching him just grow, it's, you know, it's really cool. That's beautiful, man. Hey, well, I'm just doing a quick time check here. I appreciate you spending uh, spending the time with me today. I can't thank you enough, brother. Um, obviously, I'll put some links uh, below on the podcast around Echelon Front. I'll throw some links yeah. out to that Sour Apple Sniper, cool. some of your info <laughs> and bio pages uh, as well, in, uh, social media so people can go out and find you. Um, anything that we didn't touch on today that's worth, uh, worth bringing up before we depart? Yeah, a lot. We need to do this again, man. We need to do this again, brother, for sure. This is fun. Yeah, um, man, I think the biggest thing I would, if, man, what, if you're frustrated where your life is, you need to do an honest self-assessment of yourself. And, you know, that's one of the things that we talk about at Echelon Front. And, you know, obviously Jocko talks about discipline. And one of the things I've been talking on a podcast about, and mostly it's just for my own accountability, uh, this quote that Jocko told me in January of 2020, we were at an event with a client and we were talking through some stuff that I was frustrated about. And he said, discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves. And so if you're lacking discipline in any area of your life, it's because you're lying to yourself. You know, at whatever, whatever level of discipline you have established is based off of what you're telling yourself to be the truth. So if you're lying to yourself and saying, well, you know, I'm okay with the way I look. I'm okay with how I feel. I'm okay with my finances. I'm okay with whatever, fill in the blank. Then that's all the level of discipline that you're going to put into it. But if you really were to and honest self, because Jocko and I were talking about it. He goes, hey, he goes, people say like, okay, I'm okay with how I look. He goes, do you think anybody really is okay with being fat and out of shape? Do you think anybody's like truly okay with it? No, they lie to themselves so that they feel better about it. And that's one of the things that I had been doing is like, yeah, hey, I know I'm out of shape. I know where I'm not, where I'm supposed to be, but I'm okay with it because I've been really focusing on, on business and all this other stuff. Okay. I developed that truth into my mind. 
And so the discipline that I put into my health and wellness only rose to that level. It wasn't where it should have been. So if you're not where you want to be in any aspect of your life, it's because you've been lying to yourself and your discipline will only rise to that level. So just remember, discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves. You're speaking to my soul on that one, man. I, uh, I've got one or two little areas in my life right now. I'm telling myself a couple of lies, especially with my, with my nighttime snacking. Well, <laughs> I've been talking about those. that a lot on the podcast, man. <laughs> Um, but yeah, absolutely. What sound advice, great advice. Say that again. Discipline is rooted in the truth that we tell ourselves In the truth that we tell ourselves. Uh, that is the title of this podcast, sir. Um, (laughs) and, uh, I, I cannot thank you enough for joining me today. Looking forward to the next time, uh, I get to host you on the show or I'll see you in August, my man at, at the origin camp. Sounds good, brother. I appreciate it.